Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So we have a very familiar face here today that I'm sure you guys will recognize. Yes. It's our boy, the one and only, Papa Dodson. Some of you may know him as. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, uh, he really no, needs no introduction. Yes. Welcome, Andrew. Uh, thanks for having me on again. This was a blast last time, so it's good to talk to you guys again. I know we go back and forth into emails every now and then, but, yeah. you know, this will be fun. Yeah, yeah it's man. good to have you back, man. Just like more hopefully more a little bit more casual but we do want to talk about physics yeah yeah. Um, you know for some of those because your specialty you know as terrence will fill us in yeah the nuclear and particle yeah 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 theory and he my he, man's a theorist yeah a real one <laughs> and terrence is so so many questions like we'll sometimes talk about like nuclear stuff and we're like we're kind of just like we don't have any we're just like who we're, we're kind of going back and forth about questions like, yeah, I wonder why yeah. that is. And then <laughs> not getting anywhere with nuclear yeah. stuff. So it's just, it's just funny. It's good to know somebody that knows this stuff. So you ever get that, like uh, that little sadness that you just won't ever know enough physics, Andrew. Yeah. I couldn't hear anything that you guys were saying. Oh shoot. <laughs> <laughs> we'll repeat the question. He's just like nodding. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll repeat the question, but if it cuts off again, we're just going to edit it out. Yeah. So. We'll just cut it. But yeah. But you were saying, okay. do, do you ever get any uh, any a little sadness from when you're looking at other areas of physics and you don't, you know, know what it? You can't go enough to uh, actually understand it. Oh yeah, dude, that stuff happens all the time. There's stuff where it's like I can't justify spending that much time learning something that I'm not doing professionally. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I'll do that. I mean, it doesn't even have to be physics. It could be like playing a video game and it's like taking it too seriously. And it's like, you know, you're not getting paid to do that. Right. <laughs> so it's like, it's the same concept where there are these fields that would be awesome to, you know, if you had a few lives to, to go into a bunch of them. But yeah, I'd say for me, definitely like the GR stuff I find fascinating, but that's just not my field. Yeah. Speaking uh. of the GR stuff, you have some, uh, Christoffel syndromes in the in the back. Syndromes, that's a good. <laughs> that's a Freudian slip right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's got <laughs> Christoffel syndrome. <laughs> For the video, yeah, I'm like uh, yeah. I'm like three videos away from finishing my series on tensor calculus, which nice. has been ongoing for like three years. Yeah, this one's on the Riemann curvy boy. Mm -hmm. oh. So, oh, yeah. getting getting to the end. By the way, one of some of those indices are messed up, so please don't. <laughs> please don't. I already know that it's a little bit wrong. Yeah, <laughs> so. don't, don't crucify him. Yeah, work in progress. You can tell Terrence was like, am you new or don't you mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm definitely not that guy. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, uh, Andrew, we um, we wanted to just check and see how you've been, man. What's been uh, going on lately in the uh, world of well, this... NMSU, NMSU, for those not familiar? Yeah, last year, um, so I'm all done with my core courses, finished my like qualifying and comprehensive exams, so now I'm finally a PhD candidate. Uh, I am taking one class this semester for kind of um, shits and gigs. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember. Am I allowed to swear if it pops out yeah, on this? Yeah, oh, for sure. Oh, poops, poops and gigs. I'll, I'll just play it safe. <laughs> uh, I do all swearing. Yeah, so I'm taking one class this semester. It's general relativity, which is pretty cool. Um, oh, it's it's so much more manageable than the first two years of grad school. First two years are brutal, oh, but now yeah. it's it's calmed down a bit. So true, man. I remember yeah. uh, writing on your comments like how bad it was. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, maybe I shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, shouldn't scare Andrew. But I was like, oh, he'll be fine though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the sheer volume, yeah. really. Like how yeah, how would really. you like what what would you say is like the biggest uh, for those people like you know, kind of I in grad school, what would you say is like the biggest challenge? It's, it's the homeworks, right? Like the homeworks are just consistent. There's no breaks and they're just much harder than undergrad in my experience. I, like I'm someone who, like I hear people complain about things and I'm like, maybe you're doing it just for the sake of, like you want people to think that what you're doing is really hard, <laughs> yeah. right? Because look how smart I am. Yeah. So when I would hear people complain about grad school homework, I was like, yeah, right. It can't, it's not that bad. But some of it's it's pretty bad, man. I think the homework was kind of just wanting to do well on that stuff. It was uh, it was pretty taxing. What was your experience? Pretty much identical. Same thing. It but... taxed me to leave. <laughs> <laughs> You're like I. The exams weren't too bad. I didn't I didn't think the exams were too bad. I mean, uh, but maybe that's because I put so much time into the homeworks, right? It just it for it was us like it... some conservation of effort, I guess. Yeah, for us it varied. Probably from professor to professor, 
Really, though, the weakness for me, at least, and I, I would say probably Juan as well, oh, yeah, was for sure. were the exams. <laughs> We actually got killed mostly on the mm. exams. We put a shitload of time in the homework, yeah. and then none of it translated, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, no. I don't know how that, how that works, but, I mean, it was brutal, man, because we were spending at least 30 hours at least on every exam for a prep. Yeah, way still, more than that. I mean, if you include failing. homework as review, too. Yeah, yeah, but I'm saying, yeah, like, yeah. just before the, the test, we would always do a minimum of 30 hours of study. And oh, that's, yeah, like, yeah. active study. Yeah, it depends on it's the brutal. professor. Um, but what, what would you say that... Like, would you say it's more volume of problems or is it actual, the content of the problem that makes it harder? They're just more general, right? It's like, uh, why would I ask you to solve 10 problems that are really similar? If you can solve one, you can probably just solve the very general one. Mm -hmm. And then if you can solve that, then I know you can solve the specific case ones, Mm -hmm. right? So they're very theory heavy. They're very general and it can be... Typically, if you want to derive something that's general, you got to put a lot more uh, elbow grease into like massaging the math and pulling certain relations out of your ass. So it's just, I think the fact that the grad school problems are much more general made them a lot harder to solve. And then there'd be like part C that's like, now take the limit that blah, 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 and recover the thing that you do know. You right, know? right, right, right. <laughs> Classic. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sounds pretty, uh, yeah, sounds pretty familiar, I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so then what, um, what do you think has gotten easier, Andrew, um, since you've been out, man? Well, at least I definitely have more time Sorry. on my hands. I mean, now I'm just doing research before, like when you're taking classes, I think it's really difficult to also be doing research. If you feel like you have to be doing well, like getting A's on your exams. Uh, and then it's like, how the hell am I supposed to find time to also solve like professional problems? Uh, so now it's, it's just so much easier. Like you can just, I don't know. That's pretty much that occupies most of my time now. It's just doing research problems. So that gets a lot easier. Did you guys get to that? I know Terrence, you kind of, you stopped after a certain point, right? Yeah, you got it. Did you, did you guys do research throughout your, uh, graduate experience or was it just the classes? So my research, I got mostly done during the summertime. So when summers would hit, hit when I, and then I was out of class, I was actually pretty efficient in my lab too because I had so much undergraduate experience for research. I was basically the only undergraduate. I was basically the only one in my lab uh, during undergraduate for three years. So pretty much everything was dependent on me, um, and I and I got kind of ahead in terms of research, and I was able to be pretty useful in the lab. Actually, strangely enough, in graduate school, my first few years. But I didn't get enough research to where I would be able to make a thesis, we'll say. Gotcha. Yeah. And then for me, I I just had I, – I worked on basically a master's thesis throughout. So I just had a bunch of work that I had to do um, as part of my, like, fellowship. Um, so they really hammered it on to really be juggling classes, research, uh, TAing. It was brutal. It was brutal. Mm-hmm. So, like, it, it's just, I, I guess, like, I guess it just depends on, it, it, sometimes it feels like, uh, you know, when you have a lot of, like, stuff like that on your plate, it can sometimes feel like you're half-assing a bunch of stuff. I don't know if that's how it felt, like, when you when you were doing your classes stuff, you're like, shit, I should be doing research more. But I suck at multitasking, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I can't stand that feeling where it's like, I have to do a little bit of a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. That's the worst. Do you think that's kind of mm-hmm. like what separates grad school from undergrad? Because it's like in undergrad, I felt like I could focus more on just classes legitimately. Um, there was no pressure, I guess, to do research, right? Or TA or whatever. Mm-hmm. Would you say that that's kind of like the experience or the difficulty increase? Yeah. I mean, it feels like you have uh, a bunch of priorities and none of those priorities know about each other. <laughs> so it's like you have the TA and the you have to TA, you have to do research, maybe as well, you have to do your classes. And somehow it's like you have to get all of it done at the same time. And it seems like something that would be really easy to communicate with each other and be like, hey, there's an exam this week. Uh, do with that as you will to be re- a reasonable person. Sometimes that's not how it goes, though. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, yeah, you are dividing your time amongst a lot of different things. Now this is my third year, so I... I don't have to be taking any classes, so that's cool. 
uh, I'm not TAing anymore, which is awesome. Oh, sure. so yeah, I love Beautiful. I love being able to just focus on one thing for once. So you're you basically know? a free man now. In some sense. <laughs> a lot for you. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's great. Yeah, so my, life is good. I knew you my looked advisors, happier. I have two. Re- oh, go ahead. I said I know. You, I knew you looked happier. <laughs> <laughs> you're glowing, man. <laughs> it's the it's the ring light, the oh, halo see, yeah. light thing <laughs> that all the makeup tutorial people use. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said you had two research advisors. Yeah, so that's interesting. So I have two research advisors. One of them lives in Germany. So it's just it's that's the only stressful thing. It feels like this semester is like trying to coordinate times where everyone can meet during COVID mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's like all of the all of the workshops and stuff. That you would usually it would be a big thing to go to, right? It'd be like this once or twice a year. I'm going to this workshop to participate in these conversations and see what everyone's doing. Now they're just all online. So you can go to a bunch of them. So it's like everyone, even though everyone's home, there's so much less available because everyone's going on these like international calls and that are, that are happening that normally you'd have to pick and choose which ones you go to. So the scheduling could be a bit, is, is pretty, it's not as easy as you may expect it to be during COVID. Mm. I wonder if they would do any of that with Clubhouse. Are you on no, that app? Probably not. Andrew, have you checked mm-hmm. it out? You're no, I don't know what that is. Okay, Clubhouse is kind of this popular app that came on the scene lately, and all the public intellectuals have been going on there. It's basically like, I don't know if you know Discord. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a adult Discord. <laughs> Sounds like Slack. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty much, yeah, yeah. except... It's even it's even less functionality because it's just audio, straight audio. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's like you drop in and, t- and chat and stuff, but um, but yeah. yeah, I think we had a couple questions, right? Did we? we sure. Were, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I guess uh, for the audience out there, Andrew is a nuclear and particle physicist, theoretical physicist. And Andrew, if you can, I uh, guess, maybe even just tell us a little summary again of your research. I know you do this stuff with the D-term and whatnot related to um, uh, uh, nuclear nuclear stuff, but mm-hmm. I guess if you could just give a nice summary so people can get caught up again. Yes, yeah, so the, the, one of the big questions in nuclear physics is um, where does like the proton get its spin from? We know protons are made up of quarks and gluons, so there's like this naive picture where the proton is spin one half, and it's made up of three quarks, two ups and a down. So you get one half plus one half plus minus one half, and you get one half the spin of the proton. And it's like this really nice picture that you see in all the textbooks. But as it turns out, that's just not true. Uh, people can measure the spin distributions. And it turns out that the quarks that make up the proton add up to about a quarter of the total spin. So where the rest of this, where the proton gets its spin from is actually an unanswered question in in nuclear physics, which is, uh, so that's kind of related to my research is addressing this. It's such a big problem. It used to be called the proton spin crisis. Since Mm -hmm. then, people have calmed down a little bit. They just called it the spin puzzle. But uh, (laughs) I guess you just kind of calm down with age a little bit. Uh, So yeah, understanding where the proton spin comes from is a big thing that I'd like to address, you know, throughout my research. And other properties that are inside of the proton, um, it's also not clear how to how to access this information. So you mentioned the D term. What we think is it's related to how pressure is distributed inside of the proton, how you get this balance of forces going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, how to make that I- identification to pressure distributions, no one really knows how to do it. Um, the, the problem, to get like a little bit technical, you may have seen in like your ENM that you can relate charge densities to like electromagnetic form factors. You Fourier transform the form factor, you get a charge density. And that's totally fine to do in classical mechanics. But when you're, you know, I, I do, we're doing things at relativistic energies and, and velocities. So you need to be really careful with what you mean when you're doing Fourier transforms in a certain frame. And it turns out there's not really a way to develop this three-dimensional picture of things in a way that's relativistically consistent uh, more often than not because, well, for one, you can't resolve three dimensions 
to within the Compton wavelength of the target that you're probing, right? So trying to get this truly three-dimensional picture of things is it's no good in uh, in if you want things to be relativistically consistent. So we're working on finding other ways around that and getting these cool pictures. So might have been all over the place there. Um, I've been talking about it so much lately with my advisors because they're kind of like, here's what your dissertation topic is going towards. So... No, that was a great. But yeah, does uh, that kind of answer your question? Oh yeah, man, that was a great explanation. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's a really interesting problem, man. I had no idea. I know you've said it before, but I always forget that the proton uh, spin is kind of an unknown thing, and you kind of take it. You're like, oh, we we you 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 take that the fact that they know the proton spin for granted. You forget that it's kind of mm-hmm. not a resolved question. Yeah, the way I think about it is like. There's so much that we do know, but it, and it's like uh, it's humbling that we don't know what to do with it. It's like if you have you know what the bicycle looks like, and then someone dumps all of the parts of the bike on the floor, and maybe even a catalog that says what every name is. That doesn't mean you can reassemble the bike. Like right. we don't know what those instructions are to see how we know that the spin of the proton has to come from the spin of the quarks, the gluons, and their orbital angular momentum, but how? We don't know, and we don't know how to access that information completely yet uh, from a theoretical standpoint. So, so I mean, like, I'm sure you've had to do, like, a prospectus and, like, you know, the, you, you've read probably a shit ton of literature on this. But, like, w- what are, like, the competing, I guess, theories? Are there, are there competing theories? Are there, like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure your approach is one, might be one approach or something, like, trying to figure – something something out something out using like a math modeling of sorts so there's uh yeah there, there's i don't know if i call it competing theories but there's different what are called sum rules mm-hmm. which say how angular momentum add together to give you things like spin and since we don't we can't really access that information experimentally it's not clear which one is right so there's these different sum rules that say how this stuff should be partitioned up uh and Basically, what it comes down to is in, in like a scattering experiment, if I want to measure properties of the particle, measure properties of my target, I need to scatter a beam of particles off of it. And depending on the energy of the experiment, I'm either going to shatter that target apart or it's going to remain intact. Yeah. So if you rem- let it stay intact, you're kind of just measuring the overall form of everything, and that gives you access to what are called form factors. So this will give you like how is charge distributed inside of the target? What about the magnetic moments? Things like that. If you increase the energy of the experiment and you break stuff apart, you're really probing the internal structure. You're seeing how quarks and things are distributed inside of the target. So that that extra energy gives you access to what are called structure functions. So the two kinds of experiments, elastic and inelastic scattering, if you're not breaking the target apart or you are, uh, those get parameterized in terms of these things called form factors or structure functions. In nowadays, people have learned how to kind of follow the family tree up to see what are these things part of. What's the what's the bigger picture here? Mm-hmm. And that brings you to these like really general objects that are called generalized parton distributions, which. Uh, yeah, that's kind of where nuclear physics is at right now. It's really probing these guys to see how we can extract these uh, form factors, these structure functions, and use these various sum rules to get maybe how angular momentum uh, works inside of the proton. So it's a lot of technical technical stuff, but really what it just comes down to is you have those two different experiments, you generalize it, and then you can access those other things that I just talked about by taking certain limits. And... Um, and once everyone can agree on how this stuff adds together, then it's just – then I guess you have your answer. But right now, like how you access these things experimentally is so complicated. Like You have to polarize your beam one way. You have to polarize your target another way. You have to see what changes if you switch the polarizations. So you're measuring like how the cross-sections depend on – the spin of the particle. In other words, if your spin is pointing a different direction, do you get a different answer when you're scattering stuff? So I think it's right. kind of interesting that you'll get different scatterings depending on the direction of the spin in itself. Why would that care? Why would it care yeah. what the spin is, is pointing in? Hmm. Yeah, um, do, you, do you, um, so Andrew, when I was probing the, um, NMSU website, 
I was I was looking at the nuclear particle group and what you guys um, what your experimental facilities are, and I noticed you guys work with Phoenix uh, Brookhaven. Um, and my undergraduate institution actually worked with that group, and the nuclear group worked there as well. I was wondering, do you have any involvement with that, or do you use any of the data from Phoenix? Not yet. Uh, there, there are projects that we're working on which will use data once it's available. So you brought up Brookhaven. Brookhaven's kind of the future of nuclear physics, at least in America, because they're building a new uh, collider there. So before it was up in the air whether or not the collider was going to go to Jefferson Lab or Brookhaven and it's a really big it's a really big uh, effort it's it's going to be a massive would that be the, you know, the light source the SLS it's, it, will it be what the synchrotron light source or whatever it was it's called the electron ion collider the EIC okay. I don't yeah. know if it goes by other names uh, but since that's going to Brookhaven yeah it makes sense that a lot of different institutions are kind of buddy buddy with them right now because you know if it's not going to jefferson lab then if we want to be able to do the experiments it's going to be at brookhaven so we're going to be needing to use their data or if i want to get a postdoc and i would be doing stuff that they're going to be testing over at brookhaven so you know long story short that's that's where the future is interesting interesting so yeah I, i've only i actually went there for a uh, field trip back in undergraduate and that's why I was trying to remember what the things were being built when I was there. And I think it was the synchrotron light source. It's probably old now because I was back in like 2014 or something. <laughs> so I'm sure it's not new. But I was like, maybe they had funding issues. I don't know. You know how these things go. But um, yeah, it's really interesting though, man. Um, the, whole, uh, the whole nuclear area is so interesting to me. I know there's a lot of um, things with uh, – or – or when you're when you're speaking about the two different experiments and how they kind of have these divergences, um, is this because of the different nuclear models? Because I know nuclear physics has a bunch of uh, different models when they model things. I don't really know much past that, though. So what you would have to do with either of those cases to calculate anything, then after that, you'd have to say, okay, what model are we calculating it in? But you can formulate this stuff without a model at first. All it is is... So when I say the word cross section, all that all we're doing is counting stuff. How many? If I scatter protons off of protons, I can want to know the cross section that I measure such and such particles with such and such energy. So in a sense, it gives you like a probability that these particles are going to be made uh, with units of of like area because it's scattering into a certain cross sectional area. So if I want to do a theoretical calculation of what the cross section should be. I'll par parameterize it in terms of what I have available. Um, so when I'm parameterizing the cross section, <clears throat> you do that in terms of form factors. Um, in quantum field theory, uh, you have you all had quantum? Oh, quantum, quantum, quantum field theory. It's been a while, but <laughs> we have a quantum. But but you're going down you have, the field theory train. Okay. We're screwed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't need the field theory to understand okay. it. Just regular okay. quantum. So you have like an initial state and a final state. So you want to have an operator that brings the initial state to the final state. Yeah. So it transforms the initial state to the final state. Yeah. And in quantum field theory, those are going to be your conserved current operators. So mm -hmm. in uh, elastic scattering, you're parameterizing the cross section in terms of form factors. In deep and elastic scattering, you parameterize the currents in terms of structure functions. So it's, it may sound like it doesn't mean anything, but I guess to a theorist, that's that's like the formal way of describing it. Mm -hmm. Then to actually calculate something, then you'd have to say, well, if I want to talk about conserved currents, what model am I talking about? So that's where your thing comes in, where it's like you'd, you'd have to have like the formality is fine, but to actually get a number at the end, you have to you have to impose a model. Interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of pieces there. Way yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, interesting though, man. Super but, interesting. Yeah. yeah. But I'm definitely gonna have to like ruminate. I'll have to listen to this podcast, you know. It's later so much jargon. Try, I try to digest it. <laughs> <laughs> is there like yeah. a is there like a, a key a key paper that like it, it, people that are working on your particular yeah. problem that that like if students are interested in this, are there like key papers? Yeah, who's the like, go to? Yeah, the a really good paper. It's more of a review than anything. I think it's called. Uh, Spin-dependent structure functions and 
deep and elastic scattering or something like that. It's I want to say it's by either Manohar or Jaffe. I don't remember, mm-hmm. but that that's like the comprehensive. This is everything you'd need to know and more about that stuff. Okay. Nice. But all, I mean, it, it's it's complicated formalism, but it's saying like if I want to measure something, if I want to measure the probability that something happens, what could it depend on? It could depend on how is charge distributed. Mm-hmm. It could matter what's in the way, what little quarks, how are quarks distributed inside of the target. It could depend on like how are their spins aligned. Like all of this stuff is contained in these structure functions and form factors. So I'm calling it fancy names, but it shouldn't be surprising that the answer depends on these physical things, right? Right, right, right. Mm. Yeah. We're putting labels on on these, uh, you know, <laughs> categorizing yeah. these things, yeah. Hold on. Oh, no, okay. Really. Yeah, yeah. So um, why you turn my headphones down? Oh, my huh? bad. This was, this was yours. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, Andrew. Hold on. Technical difficulties. One's messing up my uh, headphones. I can't hear anything now, but. Are you serious? Yeah, are we, okay, okay. Are, are we still plugged in? Yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go. Sorry, man. <laughs> Sorry, I just no worries. I just juggled. I just uh, yeah. You just messed, messed up, up my audio wire. again. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. He can hear you. There we but, go. Uh, there it's we just go. you can't hear yourself. It's t- now it's too loud though. Can you turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> See one one false move with no, this janky his, setup. His, no, his the headphones whole thing are goes down. his headphones are messed up. That's the thing. Okay, okay. here we go. How's that? Okay. That yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. La there la, we la, go. la 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 la. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man, this stuff is super interesting because I I. I'm just like, man, the uh, physics is, you could just get so deep into. Yeah, you can never know any, you can't ever know enough, really. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to get lost in the math and, and talking about the math, and I don't mean to, so I'm sorry if I do that at, at points, but, you know, no. all I do is work with equations all day, <laughs> so it can be hard for me to, like, decouple from that and be like this is the physics that's actually going on like i started talking about structure functions instead of (laughs) how things are distributed which is naturally like the more (laughs) meaningful thing to talk about so sorry about that yeah man that's actually something we learn me and juan just on the podcast because it it gets so um it, it, it can it can um alienate sometimes the audience not saying that you're you're what you're doing is fine though this is just more of a high level um conversation podcast yeah but um, yeah, if we want to keep like a layman audience, you have to really almost like go over your math and then try to put it to an image, you know, and conceptualize mm-hmm. it. So we try to almost always stay away from math as much as we can. But then if we do like a podcast where we're talking about math, then it's like, this is what you signed up for on this Yeah, yeah, episode, the research. You know? Yeah, because especially like <laughs> yeah. the research topic. I mean, I, I kind of became disillusioned with physics when I actually started doing it because I was like, man, this is a lot of math. <laughs> Cause I was like, where, where's yeah. the physics, you know, he wants a bio boy. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I, and I realized this, like at the end of the problem is when you do the physics, like, you know what I mean? When you, when you solve yeah. the problem, it's well, like, the beginning and the end, the beginning and the end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. True. The beginning. Now the beginning. let H equal 10. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you just trolling, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But like, like the main work is done in the front and the back end, right? Yeah. Like, no, sorry. The, the, the physics is done in the front and the back end, but like really yeah. the, the brunt of the work is the, the middle. Yeah, but then you can just say it's all trivial in the middle, and then. Well, that's what I say. <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, oh, you're just yeah. Doing the the physics is either the physics is either like the approximation so that you can solve the math or the boundary conditions you apply at the end. Like, right. It's very <laughs> at least with what I do, it's it's like it just seems like a lot of math. But okay, I researched so. the energy momentum tensor, so it's like it's very hard to not just get tunnel vision with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right, and actually leads me to the next topic. I'm glad you segued there, Andrew, because um, the stress energy tensor is one of these things that I never really got a good chance to really grok. Because uh, the only time we learned about it, me and Juan was in um, GR, E-N- right? And that was pretty much it. ENM maybe too. Yeah, E-N-M maybe too? an ENM a little bit. But yeah. there was all this interesting stuff with it, like the shear forces and you know mm-hmm. whatever the hell. <laughs> and I was like, this is this is all like nice and and everything, but I don't know what any of this means really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, there's a nice little picture of what all the components mean that I always have to refer back to. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, could you could you maybe tell us a little bit about how that stress energy tensor works with your research, or was that all the stuff that you were already kind of saying before? 
Uh, yeah, so, I mean, the big thing is that from symmetries, you get conservation laws. Uh, so if you have, like, if it doesn't matter when you do your experiment, it means ener there's no energy coming in or coming out of, of what you're doing, so energy is conserved. If it doesn't matter where you do your experiment translationally, uh, then momentum is being conserved. and Or if you rotate things and nothing changes, angular momentum, things like that. So in a lot of theories that are um, described relativistically, you may have time and space translational invariance. And if you say what's conserved, if both of them are, uh, you get the energy momentum tensor. So before I talked about how you have these matrices, that these operators that bring initial states to final states, that conserved current for what I work in is the energy momentum tensor. And I said, uh, you may parameterize these things in terms of, I, I misspoke earlier actually, uh, the cross section is parameterized in terms of form factors. The current, the currents are parameterized in terms of the, uh, the currents are parameterized in terms of form factors. The cross section is parameterized in terms of the structure functions. So sorry if, if I didn't say that earlier, I got them switched up. But yeah, so I write down this energy momentum tensor and I take its matrix elements and I say, what could the right-hand side equal? And then you get all of the possible form factors, the stuff that's like, um, yeah, the, the stuff that should matter, the stuff that should affect your answer. Like it's, what is the mass? What is the angular momentum? What is the, uh, the D term? So how is pressure distributed? So I write, what could the energy momentum tensor be in terms of? And it's all of these physical things. So yeah. Mm -hmm. In GR, it's a completely, it comes up in a completely different way. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, that's... does size matter for the D term? Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> I Sorry, knew he. Well, was that's a separate term. You have the A term that has to do with the mass. <laughs> then you have the D term that has to do with pressure distributions, mm -hmm. and then you may also have a J term that has to do with spins. That's also in there. I don't know how they named these things, but <laughs> A J A D J yeah. hmm. A D and J. <laughs> A D J. Yeah, I Another had uh, there was one uh, research colloquium I went to, and there was a professor that called uh, Jay Z. Uh, yeah, Jay Z and <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Jay Sub Z. Yeah, Jay Sub Z, and then uh, he called this other thing be basically Beyonce. And yeah. I was just like this guy. <laughs> I was in his presentation. I was locked in as soon as he said that. I was like, okay, this guy's cool. Yeah, and that, that was kind of his punchline at the end. He's like, he like wrapped it all together, and then I was just like, wow, this guy. But like, I think we were both at the same. I one. think we were, yeah, yeah. but there was a room of academics. Like all the millennials were kind of like cracking up, yeah. and all the older folks were like, why are they? Why are people laughing? <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's funny. Um, yeah, D terms and whatnot. Man, yeah, I can't, I can't do like, I mean, all the tensor stuff in the accounting. Sheesh. Yeah, it gets brutal, man. It does. It gets brutal. It does, especially. You got any, you got any yeah. tricks for uh, keeping track like, of all like, those indices, like Andrew? Compu you don't do computational, like, do you do? Oh, he's got to. Yeah, I imagine mm -hmm. you do, right? Yeah, yeah. This is all modern. Yeah, when you actually want to calculate something, so yeah. these cross sections, you have to add up a bunch of little cross sections, right? And these, the, you have to add up all of the possible ways things can happen based off of their position and momentum. So you're yeah. doing phase space integrals, which are six dimensional plus time, Sheesh. right? So, and you want to have a discrete enough or you want to have like finite enough, good enough resolution in these yeah. things. So yeah, it's, you have to find clever ways of, uh, of doing those integrals that makes it less computationally expensive. Yeah. Usually Monte Carlo, right? <laughs> Right, it's right. better if you, if you scale the dimensions of the problem up. Monte Carlo tends to be the way to go. Yeah, TI eighty four. I'm sorry. <laughs> TI eighty four plus. Yeah. If you really want to get fancy. silver edition, yes. calm down. Yeah, silver edition. If you want to get really fancy. <laughs> what what do you, what do you like to uh, use for your language, Andrew? Your programming language. Uh, if I want to, like, get an idea for things. Or make yeah. some plots or whatever. I always use Python. I typically the only other thing that I'll use is Fortran, just because the codes are already there. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, so all of these, like uh, all of these things that you'd need in order to calculate a cross section at the end, those kinds of equations and ways to 
access the data. It's already written in Fortran, so it's like, right, why reinvent the wheel? Yep. But, yeah. yeah I started the... out with C++, though. Okay. Yeah, for the, for the uh, incoming physics kids out there, yes, you will have a good chance of having to learn Fortran <laughs> in 2021. Yeah, if you do so. nuclear and particle, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's not that – if you know a real language, it's not that hard. Okay. I've never used it because, you know, I like if you're first, if you only know Python and then you try to learn Fortran, it's hard. But if you know, that's why I call it a real one, like (laughs) ones where you have to be careful about declaring your variables and and all of these things, uh, pointers. Um, If you already have seen that stuff in another language, one that's like uh, compiled versus interpreted, it becomes it's it's just a different syntax Mm -hmm. but python only knowing python can make things a little bit hard right right yeah yeah python will give you bad habits if you don't be careful but it's yeah it'll try to do whatever you tell it to do yeah c++ will be like no you you forgot a semicolon i'm not i will scream yeah you know (laughs) so how does uh how is it how is it juggling two advisors do you does it like like I imagine, I mean, I struggle with one. Just you know, how how do you manage two advisors being like, "Hey, are you done with this?" <laughs> that <laughs> like, sounds brutal. Yeah, it does sound <laughs> brutal. Like, how do you how do you manage? It's they're so they're so reasonable, man. Like I, I have really good advisors. They're super understanding, and uh, typically I'm the one who has to like, all right, let's let's do stuff. Come on, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, but they're both like experts in slightly different areas. So it's they both like kind of converge to some really big picture. So basically, if one person doesn't know the answer to something, the other does. Cool. So yeah. it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's really sweet. It's nice. The wombo combo. Yeah. <laughs> my my One of my advisors, he's the one who kind of like invented. So I told you that it's impossible to really develop these three-dimensional pictures of of things if you want it to be relativistically consistent he was the one who invented the way around that Mm -hmm. for uh wow for certain things so he was like fine if i can't use three space i'll use one momentum and then transverse so like i'll know how much they're going this way and then i'll know where they're located in the transverse plane so it still does kind of give you this three-dimensional picture of things in a in a cool i think it's called nucleon tomography nuclear Damn. tomography it's How? based off of like medical imaging or something like that dang that's kind of interesting interesting I, I read something on i'm trying to look at it i found something on wikipedia about something phase space proton phase space maybe you're talking about qcd uh was that it qcd phase space yeah, yeah quantum QCD chronodynamic okay maybe phase that's different. diagrams or something that's probably different mm-hmm. that, no. do you do you know anything about um quantum chronodynamics andrew yeah, that's all. Um, I mean, that's like the the real world theory, but typically to solve something, you'd use simpler models. But yeah, anything that has to do with nuclear physics, it's all, that's how the quarks talk to each other. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting stuff. I don't know anything about that. I imagine it's a lot of QFT, yes? Yeah, so, I mean, QFT is the umbrella term. Like you can call mm. the first quantum field theory was QED, quantum electrodynamics. So that was the first one. Uh, and then really what you say is like, w- one thing that you may know is if you require that the phase of the wave function, uh, if I if I change the phase of the wave function, nothing happens, you get like cons- conserved charge from that. So if you promote that to what's called like a local invariance as opposed to global because no this theorem requires global Mm -hmm. uh if you promote that to local gauge uh invariance you get qed so if you take e and m and you promote global to local you get qed quantum electrodynamics so you can do the same thing you can just say well if uh, qed is u1 what about if i go to another gauge group and i say i want to do a quantum field theory where this is my gauge group instead of u1 i use su3 which is uh, which is what QCD's gauge group is. So if you say, well, here's my criteria. I want to have local SU3 gauge invariance. I want it to be renormalizable. What are my options? The only option is QCD. It's it's unique in that sense. So it's like 
the formalism, like doing the details, is, is pretty challenging because you have to know your group theory, at least your league groups, pretty well. But um, yeah, that, that's all it starts with, as you say, at least from a theorist standpoint, is you say, what's my gauge group? Okay. Th that's almost it. Also, let's make sure we, we have a prescription for handling the infinities that fall out of things. But yeah, so QED is a quantum field theory. QCD is a quantum field theory. Electroweak theory is a quantum field theory. String theory might be, nah, I don't want to talk, <laughs> talking to my ass too much for that one, but <laughs> I hear you. You were, you were just say it reduces to one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You were making me think talking about those uh, gauge groups um, about Eric Weinstein because Eric Weinstein's theory, I don't know if you know much about Eric Weinstein or who he is. Um, yeah. The geometric unity. Yeah. Yeah. He always is talking about SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. It's in, That's the standard model. Yeah, so it's imprinted in my brain because I've been trying to research it lately to try to figure out what the hell is going on with it. I might have to uh, get you to help me out or something, Andrew, because I'm like, I don't know any gauge theory. Um, I didn't study any of that. He also has things related to, um, uh, what is it, uh, differential geometry, which I barely know. Um, did you did you take uh, dif differential geometry and gauge it's like, theory? It's Why calculus not? on manifolds, right? Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you're just getting this. No, from I never took it formally. Gotcha. Damn. But yeah, it's interesting. Do you do you uh, have you ever seen his geometric unity? No. Whenever he starts talking about like fiber bundles and all of this stuff, I it, <laughs> that's a little bit above my head, like over my head. I'll tackle it one day, but right now I don't. I don't. I'm not equipped to understand it yet. <laughs> you're like I'm yeah. trying to solve one problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, people. I don't think people realize how much of a mathematician Eric is because it's like, damn, I'm trying to translate all this stuff, and they're like, "You're a theor you're a physicist, you should know this." I'm like, he's speaking a whole different language, man. Yeah, I don't know any like, of this stuff. Like mathematical, <laughs> like so. So you're like Andrew. So you're like a, you know, a theoretical physicist versus a mathematical physicist. Because I think in, in popular media, right, I think those two are kind of synonymous, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. But like, for sure. But um, but they don't have. I I would I would say that there are no, at least from what I've seen, the mathematical physicists are in math departments. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I don't know if that's experience in in your right. university, but, but yeah. I mean most most like theorists, who are like a, uh, a couple generations above us, like they they, got their degrees in math first. That's it's kind of new for us to not be doing if you think about it. Like uh, all of my advisors or, or or whatever, like they got their degrees in math first and then they tackled physics. Oh, interesting. So it's not surprising that the older people in physics um, tend to be like the theorists are are so uh, immersed in the math and, and these fancy descriptions. I just I don't know it enough. But it's also different, right? Like um. I do things in the language of tensors where you have like people like Eric Weinstein who may be more inclined to work in the language of like differential forms or uh, really, really high level math like the abstract um, or the algebraic topology in these things. Mm -hmm. So that's just not my field of math that I, that I work in. I don't need that to tackle any of my problems, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I got a lot of studying to do. Yeah, let, let, let's get to the fun stuff. Terrence, you, for some reason you had, not, not the difficult, uh, you know, so, so the listeners could turn their brains off. For a second. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But like Terrence mentioned Nassim Haramein, and I don't know why he put this in the notes for you today. I just thought it would be funny. The only problem with it, though, is I don't know if we can really go down that territory oh, gotcha, because gotcha. I don't know if we could show Andrew a video easily. Uh, all right. But it's. Uh, have you ever heard of Nassim Haramein? Uh, maybe not by name. I like to call him the Tommy Wiseau of physics. <laughs> He's like this, okay. Yeah. Do you have an image of that guy? Let me look him up on my yeah, end. Look him up. It's um N A S S I M, and then Haramein H A R A M E I N. He has a very famous uh, TED talk, right? Yeah, I wanted to send you his. I wanted you to show show Andrew a video so he can, so Andrew could be illuminated on how to actually solve the problems he's looking to solve. Gotcha, gotcha. No, I don't know him. I've never heard of him. 
So yeah, well, give, he's, him, give uh, him the rundown of his his. He's got theory. he's got a theory where he um, basically shows like what the real standard model is, or like what a real model of a particle actually is supposed to be, and he puts a little, as he calls them, tiny little plonks into a volume of a sphere, and he, you know, takes up the whole volume of the sphere. I think he's he got the number right, ten to the, ten to the uh, minus fifteenth or something. Sure. And uh, yeah, he gets some magic numbers out and. This is his model for uh, physics. For uh, yeah, for what a uh, what an atom is. So you know when you want to you know put your research down and <laughs> actually get something solved, um, <laughs> you can check out uh, Nassim Haramain's problem or his uh, solution. Yeah. Would you? Yeah, I mean, with with like models and stuff, if it all makes the same predictions, you know, who's to say which one is better than the other? So if it offers something else. <laughs> you know, oh, if people have already spent else. years learning the standard model, and someone says, "Here's my thing that does exactly the same yeah. thing," I'm not saying this is what he, he's doing, but if yeah, it, yeah. if if it's like, and I get the same answer too, mm-hmm. yeah, and it's like so he must just be saying the same thing in a different way, right? Yeah, but this guy, but this guy, the thing no, that's different. It, it's real different. Well, the thing about this guy is that Ter- Terrence likes to pick on him because he doesn't have a physics degree, I think. Right. Well, he he's got the he he he's uh his degree in understanding the universe. Okay, at gotcha. a different level. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, Sounds like half the people in my emails. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably one of them. Do do you what first first off would you do it? So if if your university hosted like a little TED talk, do you think do you think you would throw your hat in the ring? Oh, he probably could. I, like, if they asked, if they yeah, asked, maybe, okay. but. Because I, I would think, impose. I I would I would say you're you're a famous enough figure um, to do one. I think. If if they asked you, what would you do it on? Would you do it on like your research, or would you do it more on like uh, the YouTube channel stuff? You think? Uh, when I'm asked to give talks, like at universities, I tend to not talk too much about my research, but rather like science communication. Gotcha. As a whole, that tends to be more digestible, mm-hmm. and because uh, you know, there's there's no shortage of the people on TV who talk about the big topics, your string theories, black holes, dark matter, whatever, who barely scratch like scratch the surface. But it's like it's enticing, and it gets those prospective physics students interested. And then you're like, okay, cool, I want to do that. I'm going to study physics. And then you get here, and that's that's not what you learn, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like it's like that or full fledged lectures, mm-hmm. are your are the two kind of means of communication. So I, when I give those talks, I like to talk about like my different approach to the, to that kind of thing. You can still talk about the fancy stuff, but not make it so so dull or so uh, intimidating. You just gotta be a little mm-hmm. creative with it. Mm-hmm. Andrew, do you ever? So think- I would probably go. With that. Andrew, do you ever think you could go down the uh, science communicator route? Or is that just out of the question? Like TV stuff? Yeah. I don't think I would want to. I mean, I was on TV once for a show where they basically show you these satellite images of things. And they're like, here's here's our picture and then here's what happened. You're the physics person, so maybe talk about like some – like." Uh, speculate on certain things <laughs> and just not being part of that process i felt like i got taken out of maybe not taken out of context because the things i said were things that i said but it wasn't the point or it wasn't what the takeaway that i wanted to say right. so for tv stuff i would never want to do it again unless i had more control over like the editing and the distribution yeah. uh so yeah. for the foreseeable future me being able to have my hands on the YouTube thing is 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 good for me. Yeah, it's like it's like when you see like a famous well not, well like you get a a respected professor on one of those History Channel shows like Ancient Aliens or something. <laughs> they just that's invite- basically what I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you that's just, hilarious yeah yeah that is funny hey man i would take it too man i would <laughs> it's like I, a curb moment for andrew he's like <laughs> he's like that's not what i meant uh <laughs> but okay oh that's funny yeah i mean hey i would do it man i i think I'm, i mean i value science communication too i think um 
I think we do need more um, more people in that category. I think out of out of all the people right now, I mean, I, I would say that I look at people like Brian Greene um, and maybe even Sean Carroll is like one of the more popular ones. Uh, are there any, any Sean Carroll's ex- awesome? Yeah, Sean Carroll's awesome. Yeah, I I met him once at the APS uh, March meeting a couple years ago. It is a GR book. Very oh, good, sweet. very good book. Very oh, is good. it really? Yeah, it's really. So it's kind of hard to read, but it's it's good. It's all there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, I I kind of like I kind of froze up when I ran into him, and I called him uh, Steve Carroll. <laughs> <laughs> And he was like, "That took him down a notch." I kind of did. <laughs> like Michael Scott, Steve Carell. Yeah, yeah, Steve Carell. Yeah, and I was because I I just froze, man. Like I was like, oh, "Holy crap!" Like, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. He got starstruck. I was, and I and I was I was like, "Picture," and then he was just like, "Sure," and he had like this. He was laughing in the picture. <laughs> had me just kind of goofing off. But uh, have you met any of those dudes? Like um, any of those no. sort of science communicators that you you kind of like? Uh, no, I've met no one. <laughs> I've, um, I mean, I have the little cohort yeah. of people I, I talk to a lot on YouTube within like the YouTube community. But mm-hmm. as far as like, I don't know anyone on TV now, dude, I'm sure here's the thing. Like I know Sean Carroll has like his podcast mindscape. I'm oh, sure yeah. you could literally get on like, you could get him on your channel or something, but I don't know if that's something like you're it's probably not on his radar. I feel like. Andrew's kind of uh, doing his work right now, right? True, true, true. I'm on the real podcast that matters right now. Oh, so. this is why. Oh, this is why we goodness. love you. Oh my! <laughs> I'm gonna cry, bro. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> no, no, you guys. All right, enough about enough about me. Tell me about you. Okay. Uh, you guys have come a long way with your podcast. You're, you're, you know. Yeah. I, this is gonna be the new, the the big one for like. Thank you, man. For the real physics topics. I mean, there's no one talking. There's no one who doesn't hold back. Yeah. And maybe that's something that's just more, maybe that's why you guys appeal to me, but there's no one who's just like, there's too many people who are compromising, explaining what things are for what they are like to make it appeal to a a much wider audience. Mm -hmm. But it's like, that just means there's not much for people who have, who've outgrown that. Yeah. You know, so you guys are really feeling, feeling a niche that, I think is needed. Thank you so much, man. Thanks, We're man. trying. We're trying yeah. to be the give no fucks, you know, yeah. let it all out there. <laughs> physics guys. T- Did you have that, you had that uh, video recently on like favorite equations or important equations, but it wasn't like just F equals MA. Like Terrence <laughs> was talking about or Lagrange, the right. yield equations, what right. else? A lot of other things, but I was like, hell Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. When does that stuff get? When, when does Euler Lagrange equations get any love? Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, it we, needs more love. These are the kind of things I, I just, I just want to do the things that I wanted to know about when I was an undergrad, yeah. you know, or even before that, when I was a kid. You know, a work, a working man's, working man's physics. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like I, I kind of see it like a, um, I, I think Richard Feynman had this like book that he would learn from it was in, a, oh, it's in his a autobiography yeah yeah that said like something it helped him a lot but him as an american physicist uh was very illuminating apparently i forget the name of the book it was something Do you know like is it in his physics lectures? for the no it's it was uh this was like in his autobiography mm. he was learning from it as he came up as a young physicist it was something like physics for the layman mm. or something and and I think he tried to model his lectures in that way. And I kind of look at it as like, I'm like, yeah, I kind of, you know, us being American students, I think we have a unique sensibility of sorts um, to kind of, uh, you know, kind of play in the mud a little bit. Right. So yeah. I, 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 I'm, I don't think we're afraid to take it there. Sometimes. Yeah. We just got to get our hands dirty. Yeah. To continue the analogy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, we, we greatly appreciate it. And hopefully yeah. uh, hopefully we can continue to grow the channel. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's fun. It's still hopefully, fun. So. Hopefully, actually, we we wanted to... Uh, we're kind of thinking about branching out a little bit. Um, like into more sort of... Uh, 
other channel stuff, but besides podcasts, like sort well, of. Don't a, say this because now, if, now if the pressure. People, on? yeah, if people well, see this podcast, which they definitely will, <laughs> with Andrew on it, they're gonna be like, "Where's the other channel at?" Uh, yeah, Damn yeah. it, Juan! <laughs> Come on, man, this will put pressure on us. <laughs> <laughs> don't do this! Don't do this to us. <laughs> No, it's good. It's good. Um, but yeah, I mean, like we were like, man, we got to do something with Andrew. We wanted we wanted to see if we could bring you on because we know you're like a uh, like you, you're a big pr- supporter of us, and like we're like, man, we got to have Andrew on on one of these like mm-hmm. future kind of like sort of video projects that we're gonna mm-hmm. be doing. So yeah, we'll just say. Stay tuned. Stay tuned, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to talk after or something about yeah. what you had in mind. That way yeah. you're not spoiling it. Yeah, yeah, yeah for, for sure. For everybody. Sure. Or, or like getting a, people's hopes up too more. <laughs> good, good. I would, you know, I, I think it's good. I mean, an, an epic crossover of sorts. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be nice. And just, I guess let's take it a little lighter note. Andrew, do you have any cool movies or anything that you've been into lately, man? Yeah, Kelly and I have been... Uh, Rewatching the extended versions of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I, How much longer can it get? I haven't seen the extended ones since I was a kid, and each one is like over four hours long. Holy it's awesome. Sheesh, man. <laughs> so you literally just feel like you're out there walking with them. Yeah. That's <laughs> point of view. Yeah, and it's like, it's kind of funny because you'd expect them to. Some stuff is like, how did they cut this out of the original movies? And some stuff is like, you really had to include Gandalf sniffing. Like that was, <laughs> that had to be in the. Like, I understand why so much of it was cut out because it's like, whose idea was it to have that in the first place? But yeah, that's been a lot of fun. Been watching Lord of the Rings. I've been listening to it on uh, like audiobook. Nice. The The Silmarillion, if you're familiar. Yeah, you're. So yeah, I've been been nerding out on that. Nice. What about you guys? I've been actually stuck on the Orville. I don't know if you've heard of it. Nope. Oh. So it's basically, uh, I don't know, are you a Star Trek nerd at all, Andrew? Not really. Okay. I'd like to get into it at some point. Bro, you like got to get into it. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. It's yeah. such a physicist thing, man. I used to be anti-Star Trek for most of my life. And then when I was just like, let me just try it out. <laughs> I've never turned back, man. I'm a full-on Trekkie over Star Wars even. <laughs> it's it's, it's yeah. insane now, yeah. And the Orville's basically the Seth MacFarlane answer to Star Trek. Um, and it's uh, it's got more comedy in it. It's really good. Uh, okay. I highly recommend it. Yeah, but you will be... What st- are you watching on? Hulu. That's yeah. the downside. This video is sponsored by... <laughs> <laughs> but be Just kidding. Us. For legal reasons, that's a joke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but be- as long as they pay us. Yeah, beware though. You will be stuffed into a locker after... Subsequent viewings of Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, my my uh, my physique is already atrophying. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I make fun of Terrence because he's like, you should watch Star Trek, bro. I'm telling you, would, it's so it's such a physicist show. I man. don't want to become a caricature. Terrence. <laughs> Just accept it. Man. We're nerds. It's never gonna change. Is there is there something, Andrew, that you're like, I will not become a caricature of of a physics nerd. <laughs> Do you have this like sense in you? I think or? I've embraced it. I kind of jumped both feet in, I guess. Yeah, that's uh, the man. But I also just I like a lot of things, man. I, I have yeah. a bunch of interests. I just like liking things. So yeah, yeah, true. yeah. I mean, I, all the stuff that you, a physicist would normally be, I guess, stereotyped as enjoying, I eat it up. Nice. For the most part. Good. Stuff. I mean, I don't watch the pop science stuff anymore, but I did. You know. Yeah, yeah. So. I feel like a lot of us probably got inspired by that. Who is who is your guy, Andrew, or your guy or gal that inspired you the most, pop sci wise? Uh, I loved Michio Kaku and Neil deGrasse Tyson. Also, yep. I mean Stephen Hawking. I watched his into into the universe like a million times. Mm. Yeah. So I guess they kind of covered all the bases. Yeah. Yeah. True. I think. Yeah, we're pretty much the same era. So. Yeah. 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 So those were definitely our guys, even though Sagan was a badass too, but yeah. I think he was a little bit too before our time, probably. Yeah, he's, yeah, exactly. He was before my time. There's some stuff I've seen of Sagan where I'm like, that's awesome, like his proving the uh, Earth is round. That yeah, that's thing where he talks about the angles and the shadows. Yeah. Right, right, with <laughs> yeah. um, Diogenes. Uh, what is it, the uh, Greek guy? No, maybe. Testicles. Testicles. <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank he you. Has to, he has to <laughs> test things rigorously, by the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We're, yeah, we're so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and, anyway, the uh, the uh, yeah he he's a uh, Sagan is a is a good one. Yeah. Um, but your guys are Michio and uh, Neil too. Isn't no, I it? think I well, liked I think I liked Feynman a lot more. I like really got oh, into well, oh well, sure into, uh, yeah one I got I mean I, but I you you got into him before the pop size stuff. I yeah I think I got into Kaku after after I found out about no Feynman. shit yeah, but it's because. Uh, he was such an eclectic figure, and I was like, mm-hmm. "Oh, cool! This guy, this guy's playing bongos and singing <laughs> about orange juice." I want to, <laughs> yeah, what a what a cool guy! But um, let me see. I guess I guess all the popular physics people, like Einstein, I, I kind of got more attached to figures in in physics. Mm-hmm. I guess as I mm-hmm. went along. Yeah, who who's your favorite like real physicist, Andrew? Historically, I guess. Yeah, like yeah. real legit guy or gal. I mean, abs- I mean, Feynman, absolutely, I think, because not only was he the best science communicator, but he was also a physicist's physicist. The man practically invented QED, yeah. with the first quantum field theory. So he, he had a Nobel Prize. Uh, not that prizes matter, but, you know, just for being acknowledged by the community itself, you know what I mean? So Feynman... You know, he had a great way of explaining things, and he really moved the needle forward yeah. in uh, in particle physics. So I think, without a doubt, him, uh, Einstein, the, Einstein, I just find like inspiration from a lot. Where like, how would he do it? When he, if you look about like the story of deriving his field equations, it's just it makes sense. It like that the way he went about it makes more sense to me than say how Hilbert did. Because I don't know if you know know the story, like no, uh, no. like when GR wasn't finished, Einstein gave like a little bit of a a lecture, a primer on what he was doing, but it wasn't done yet. And Einstein's whole approach was taking Poisson's equation and generalizing that. So instead of a potential, you have like the metric, and instead of a, a mass density, you have the energy momentum tensor. And it's very like having these things generalized to make them be able to be written in the language of tensors that reduces to things that we already know. And I'm like, that's, that's perfect. That's, and talking about symmetries. I'm like, that's exactly how I want to think and approach these, these problems. And then you have Hilbert who has like this completely different mathematical approach using variational principles and just varying in action with respect to a, and it's just this, it's not how I think. Yeah. So I love, I love how, I love the history of how Einstein did things. So from like inspiration, inspiration on how to solve problems or how to tackle them. I love Einstein. And if I want to explain stuff, I'd look at Feynman, you know, those nice. are great choices. Most yeah. generic answer ever. But nah, nah, nah. It's, it's, it's kind of, yeah. It, but it's like, these, these are the answers icons. for a reason, right? Yeah. They're icons <laughs> for a reason. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Feynman uh, was definitely a huge one. Cause he's like, also for me, he was like, Oh, you can actually be cool and be a physicist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I didn't know that before. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. You, you can be like a. You cannot necessarily fit in. He 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 notoriously didn't really fit yeah, in. A yeah. lot of physicists didn't like him because. Uh, yeah. He was young and uh, unapologetic of about his like. Uh, how would you say him being like naive? His, I guess, or maybe naive. He had a sense of naivete that people like. Sure, sure. Kind of like bruised him about, but. Right. He was, he was a rabble rouser. We'll he was, say. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, there's this story of, of Feynman. Oh, sorry, I cut you off. No, go ahead, go ahead. There's the story where he's giving a lecture and and Dirac is in the in the audience, and Feynman's talking about uh, like his paths and all of these things, and uh, Dirac asks from the audience, "Is it unitary?" And Feynman to like continued lecturing and. Uh, Yes, again, is it, is it unitary? And Feynman didn't know what the word unitary meant. Um, but so Feynman goes, is what unitary? And Dirac goes, the matrix that brings your initial state to your final state, is it unitary? And since Feynman didn't know what unitary meant, 
uh, he responded to Dirac by saying, well, let me finish the lecture and then you can decide for yourself if it's Unitarian. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm paraphrasing a bit, but I thought that that's awesome. That's a great but deflection. He, like you said, the naivete, I think, is kind of like not knowing the names of things. Yeah. <laughs> like he's talked about. Yeah. Like knowing, the, not, knowing the name of something doesn't mean you understand it. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think yeah. he even famously so. said that too at one point, right? Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. one of his interviews. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. Uh, what's our time, Juan? Oh, so I we think don't we're lose close all the to time. Yeah. Yeah. We're capping at Terrence's. Uh... Yeah, I got to get a camera with more time. Yeah, but... we really do. And any <laughs> suggestions? Nice cameras. <laughs> no, mine. Mine. I have to like stop it every twenty-eight minutes. Jeez. Or else wow. it stops. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> oh dang. Okay. Yeah, I'm not the guy. I like tech, but I don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Said every physicist ever. Like I'm not someone who can talk about specs of anything. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, like yeah, you people said. should know that physicists don't know shit about tech. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> I know even photography. I'm like, oh, it'd be cool to get into photography, and I'm like, okay, there's apertures. I should know this shit, but it's like sent. That's actually really badly documented. Just for the record. Apertures and all this stuff, like f stop and all this, and yeah. the sensor sizes are horribly documented okay. online. Okay. People need to get better at documentation. If you're watching this and you're a camera person who's like a scientist or tech person, yeah, get better documentation for camera stuff. It's mm -hmm. annoying. It is extremely it is. annoying. Yeah. As content creators, sorry, that's my that's my rant <laughs> soapbox for. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, but. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Well, and, we anyway, Andrew, thank thank you so much, man, for coming on. Uh, and taking time to explain, we your, love him. Your sacred research. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, man. Thanks so much. <laughs> this was fun, and I hope uh, I hope the torches aren't already lit for me saying the cross section is parameterized <laughs> instead of form factors instead of instead yeah. of structure functions. I know that that's unforgivable for a nuclear physicist. So. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Just prepare. Just yeah. prepare. Just prepare. That's been on the back of my mind since it happened. Yeah. God. You're like. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, prepare for the literal, like, uh... This is why me and Juan all just qualify of just our statements, like, we're dumb sometimes. Just <laughs> please. Please, yeah. we're, please, we're human. Don't yeah. don't crucify us. We're... Yeah. We say stupid things sometimes, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but yeah. yeah, thanks again, Andrew. Yeah, man. Um, so yeah, absolutely, guys. This was awesome. Did you yeah, want to plug anything before we go? Yeah, any new projects, man? Uh... I have some in the works, but not to talk about yet, I suppose. Gotcha. I do, yeah. Look forward to yeah, I'll it. I'll leave it at that. Nice. Okay. Right. What's up? And, no, it said you're nice. Saying, yeah, you're saying look, look, look forward to that. Yeah. For the audience. Yes. And with that, do you know. I have some really stupid unsponsored videos coming that I'm excited <laughs> for. Oh, that's always oh, that's good stuff. Yeah, that's the yeah, good yeah. Stuff. For sure. For sure. Hell yeah. Well, don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe, Yes, folks. indeed. And if you haven't already, obviously check Andrew's channel. Check More than likely, boy. you are coming from Andrew's yeah, channel. Yeah, yeah. This isn't helping him. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you uh, for coming and listening. Oh, look, he gave us a heart. Bro. Oh. You're going to make me cry, man. I'm... <laughs> no, but anyways, thank you, everybody. And thanks, Andrew. We'll see you all later. See ya. Peace. See you guys.